Hello, Shane Ann. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Where did Shakespeare learn how to write an iambic pentameter? Well, there's no record of Shakespeare's schooling, but most scholars believe that he attended. There's a local grammar school in Stratford-upon-Avon, which is still there. I've actually visited it, that he would have studied Latin and Greek there. Now, what's interesting about the Latin to me is that he would have read Ovid, and Ovid shows up at, with many in many of the plays. He uses different parts of it. He also probably would have attended the medieval miracle plays, which were uh, stories based on the Bible. They were still being performed in Coventry, and Coventry is about 20 miles from Stratford-upon-Avon. So those two things would have in- influenced him. You know, we don't have any record of exactly what his schooling was or how he learned how to write an iambic pentameter. Why was writing in verse important for these plays? The verse was the style of the times and all of the playwrights wrote in verse. Ben Jonson, Thomas Kidd, Christopher Marlowe, they all used iambic pentameter structure. And the big reason is that, from my point of view, is that it was very close. Iambic pentameter is very close to the English language. And I can talk about that uh, more in just a moment. But that is the style of the time. That's how, how people wrote. You know, since we're talking about iambic pentameter, I should mention what a regular line of verse is. A regular line of verse is made up of five metrical feet, and we're alternating unstressed and stressed beats. So the rhythm is de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum. You can hear how strong that is. What does that remind you of? Da, 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 like da, da. Horf, horses hoofbeats. It to does me. sound like a horse. Absolutely. The other thing is that it sounds like a heartbeat. Da dum da da. If you've ever listened to it a heart, it does. Like, it yeah, does sound right. like a heartbeat. And that's the power of the rhythm. That's the power of it. And once an actor or a reader feels that regular rhythm, then they're going to feel when the rhythm changes. And these changes are often clues as to what is going on in the action of the play. And I can talk more about about those in just a moment. Let me just give you a couple of of examples of a regular line. So here's one. If mu- I'm going to read the rhythm first. If music be the food of love, play on. You can hear how strong that is. It's absolutely regular. Now, if my actor was saying that, they're not going to read that rhythm, but it's there. It's, it's in their bodies. If music be the food of love, play on. And you can hear the rhythm is still there. Another one from a speech in Julius Caesar is, a curse shall light upon the limbs of men. You can hear da 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 Again, the actor would say, a curse shall light upon the limbs of men. But we hear the rhythm even though he is saying he is saying it, making it make sense. And one last example is uh, in As You Like It, I pray you do not fall in love with me. I mean, you could almost dance to it. It's so rhythmical. But she says, I pray you do not fall in love with me. So those are regular lines. Once the actor feels it in his or her body, then they're going to notice the changes. Let me give you one example of a change. So here's a change that we were just talking about the regular line. This is when the meter reverses. So we just did unstressed, stressed, right? A curse, I pray. Here's the opening line of Richard III. I'll read the rhythm first. Now is the winter of our discontent. And the actor would say, now is the winter of our discontent. So that very first foot, as he walks on the stage and says that, is going to be stressed. Another example is Constance in King John. The first line in her scene, she comes in and she says, gone to be married, gone to swear a peace. So she would say, gone to be married, gone to swear a peace. She's furious about what's happened, and Shakespeare has given her this strong beat to start off the scene. This is called a trochee, stressed and then unstressed. I feel like it's jarring, 
to the line, both for the actor to investigate it and for the audience to hear it. In some speeches, it gives an urgency to the beginning of the line. It changes the pace from the da 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 Very helpful for the actor and the reader to know about these changes. I had a science teacher in school that just to be funny, he would always use the phrase, you put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. And I remember that phrase, not for the science associations he was using it for, but because it helps me understand Shakespeare. I think as a student, we like to think that you know, where that teachers are making this up somehow, that there's not really emphasis on different syllables. But when you change where we yes. put the emphasis on normal phrases, you can see exactly what you're demonstrating here that yes, in order to teach you this, I am slowing down where I put this emphasis so you can hear it. But there is a emphasis in regular spoken speech. So while you may not be paying attention to it as an audience member, when you analyze these plays, you can see where Shakespeare was paying attention to it as a writer to include these subtle differences. It's pretty neat. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And that example of putting the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable is fairly common. I mean, I've I've heard that before. And it's perfect for talking about the the meter of Shakespeare. My theory about Shakespeare and you know, I, I, it's only a theory, is that he just sat down and wrote that this is in his body. He knows how to write these. I don't think he went, oh, let's see, I want a trochee here. I want a, you know, something else here. That's the way he wrote how many of the plays he wrote in a very short period of time. Not a lot of time for rewriting. Does that make sense, right? You know, yes, well, that, it absolutely yeah. makes sense because I think even if, you know, if I'm writing notes about this podcast, for example, I'm not necessarily a consciously thinking through the detailed grammatical rules that I am applying. So we can look and apply the rules of iambic pentameter to Shakespeare as well. Yeah. Yeah. I've read that the specific meter of iambic pentameter came originally from the French, specifically 12th century troubadours of Provence. Acknowledging the 12th century was much closer to Shakespeare than the 12th century is to us today. How did this rhyme scheme become popular in England? How did it make that jump from France to England? Well, I'm not sure I can talk about how it made that jump, but I do know that from about 1150 in France, all of the plays that were written were written in rhyme. Now, that's different from Shakespeare and some of the others we're going to talk about. But in this period of time, my understanding is that the reason that it was in rhymed verse is that these plays were being played outdoors, and that's where they were performed, and it's easier to hear a rhymed verse and understand what someone's saying. And that actually makes sense to me from the few performances I've seen outside that were not miked. Now, the meter at that time was quite different. It was often lines of 14 syllables. So it was called iambic heptameter. That's a verse line of seven feet. How it went from France to England and changed into the five feet, I I don't know. I mean, I know a little bit about the sonnets coming from Italy and stuff, but I don't, that transition, I'm, I'm just not familiar with. Iambic pentameter does follow this specific format we've been discussing. And I think that leads to an expectation of rigidity that it has to be this one way. But in addition to the trochee you alluded to earlier, are there additional variations with iambic pentameter Yes, there, there are a lot of them, but one of the most famous ones is called a feminine ending. And this is, you know, some 18th century person made up this title. But what it is, is an extra unstressed syllable. So you have your regular line, and then you have this extra unstressed syllable. So let me give you some examples, and, and then I think you'll hear what it does, and we can talk about it. So It's interesting, Portia, when she's talking to Julius Caesar, I'm going to read the rhythm of this. She says, it will not let you eat or talk or sleep, regular, and could it work so much upon your shape, regular, now listen to this though, as it hath much prevailed on your condition, there's our extra unstressed syllable, right? Now, is there anything wrong in his behavior or strange? in his, Yeah, he's acting like someone she doesn't even know anymore. So it's interesting that Shakespeare has put the word condition, or he's given it that extra unstressed syllable. I, I'll come back to that in a second. Another, I mean, one of the most famous speeches in all of Shakespeare 
starts with four feminine endings. To be or not to be, that is the question, that's feminine. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer, feminine. The slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, feminine. Or to take arms against a sea of troubles. I'm a little bit splitting between reading the rhythm and the sense. So you're playing Hamlet. You need to figure out why Shakespeare gave you those four feminine endings at the beginning. I don't think it's an accident. I think there's, a, there's something going on there. For me, what the feminine ending does is, or one thing it does, is it breaks that regular rhythm. You could even go so far as to say it undermines it, like in the Portia line. She's going along, da-da-da-da-da-da, and then condition uh, jumps out at you. Also, I tell the actors, it's often helpful to look at the word that has a feminine ending. This doesn't always work, but here's a couple of examples. There's a line in Richard III, uh, we know he's deformed, where Richard says, that laid their guilt upon my guiltless shoulders. Shoulders is a feminine ending. Is there anything wrong with his shoulders? Yes, he's deformed. So it's interesting. I don't think you have to do a big thing with it, but it's interesting that that's the word. Iago, almost in Othello, almost every time he talks about that he's honest or that people call him honest, it's almost always a feminine ending. And there's basically nothing honest about Iago. So I just think it's interesting that, that that's pulled out, right? So that's a huge difference from the regular line that Shakespeare uses, I think, to great effect. You mentioned earlier that iambic pentameter mirrored the English language. And I wonder, is iambic pentameter something Shakespeare employed as a prop on stage for the actors to do what you're saying, to alert the audience to these problems or to indicate that something's wrong? Or was this an example of the normal speech pattern in 16th century England and their accents and how they spoke? I wouldn't go so far as to call it a prop. I would say it is a choice. It's a choice of the playwrights of that period. And I can give you some more examples in a moment. Christopher Marlowe, is often credited with making iambic pentameter popular. You know, that's what scholars say that have written and investigated, right? But people on the street did not speak in verse. And I think sometimes, I, I think because people are so familiar with Shakespeare or read Shakespeare or other plays of the time, they start to think that's how they talk. But they didn't, they just talked. But as I mentioned a while ago, the iambic pentameter is very close to the way we speak. An example of that is if you say big black bear, actually just say that with me. Big, big black, black bear, bear. bear. Okay, so that's three solid words right after the time. But in iambic pentameter, it would be the bigger, blacker bear. The second one just flows. Can you feel it? The bigger, blacker bear. That's iambic. And that's the way you and I actually talk to each other. We alternate stressed syllables with unstressed syllables. So they, they did that back then. They did it 400 years ago. It simply is the way that we talk. So the iambic is really, really close, and it worked for the playwrights to use it of that time. In a write-up for Sydney Theatre Company magazine, Mike Bartlett claims that sometimes there's an action on stage which Shakespeare specifically includes because, quote, the meter serves that purpose, end quote. Do you agree with Mike Bartlett that iambic pentameter actually influences the actions of the actors on stage? Well, I haven't read the article, but two things that I think he might be talking about. Some actions in the play are literally written into the verse, li literally in the, in the words. Brabantio says to Desdemona, come hither, gentle mistress. So the actor needs to move closer to him, right? That's in the text. Or in uh, All's Well That Ends Well, Helen says, then I confess here on my knee. So clearly she goes down on her knee, right, to, when she's talking to the countess. The other thing that's possible that he's talking about is the space in the verse for an action. A good example is when Iago is trying to figure out what to do to Othello, he says, and Will is tenderly be led by the nose, talking about Othello, as asses are. So that line is, as asses are, bump, 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 bump. There are three feet of silence. And then Iago says, 
I have. So that space there has given Iago or the actor time, just a fraction of a moment to say, oh, I know what I'm going to do. And then he says, I have. So there's lots of examples of that in Shakespeare. I'm not sure that that's what he's talking about, but I think those, those spaces are very important and for the actor to be aware of them. I know as a voice coach, you work with actors who are performing Shakespeare or preparing to perform Shakespeare's works all the time. And is this meter something that is often a stumbling block for actors approaching Shakespeare? You know, I have not found that to be true in my experience, but I think the reason for that is I always start with explaining the verse structure, really what we're talking about now, what's a regular line, you know, what goes against it. And Actors are eager for the clues that are in the verse. They want to know what they are. And so, you know, just it's like knowledge is power. So the more knowledge that they have about the verse, the easier it is to work on and and enjoy, quite frankly. We also, both in workshops or in my voice and speech classes, we do a lot of exercises that have to do with getting the verse into the body, you know, physicalizing the images or moving at the end of the verse line, lots of things like that. So that's, yeah, my experience is that they, they enjoy working on it with verse. And it's different than, you know, doing a TV script or a movie script or something. Why do you think more modern plays don't continue this tradition of writing plays in verse? I don't know. <laughs> the only thing I can think of, and this is, I mean, I have no idea, is that it's not easy. If you're trying to write something with using the regular lines, if it, say it was iambic pentameter, which it probably would be, if somebody's going to write a play and then try to do it in verse, I think it would take double the time, triple the time. You know, I don't know. There are a few, there's a little spots here and there of plays written in verse, but it, it's definitely rare. Yeah. Do you know when this meter fell out of fashion? Well, as far as I know, all of these plays were being written in verse until the Restoration, which is the, the late 1600s. At that time, then people like William Congreve, who wrote Love for Love, The Way of the World, he was writing not in verse, but in prose. And But every now and then, he would put uh, an iambic pentameter couplet at the end of a scene. Same thing happened in the relapse. Uh, Van Bru would also put rhyming couplets in, but it was really going out of fashion. And from then on, as far as my research shows it, from then on, uh, plays were written in prose for the most part. So it really is kind of a slice of Shakespeare's history to have it be in iambic pentameter. Absolutely. It's a huge slice. Yes. Many people blame their struggles with understanding Shakespeare's plays on iambic pentameter. As a professional voice coach who's uh, this expert in Shakespeare, do you think the metered rhyme scheme of the lines increases or decreases its readability? Well, I would say from my point of view, it definitely increases it. I do think it's helpful, which I was talking about before working with actors, on exercises and understanding the two, you know, understanding the techniques of verse. But I do think it's it's helpful to know that. But you don't need to be a Shakespeare scholar to understand the plays. I remember talking to a child who was in third or fourth grade, so I think that would be eight or nine years old, and she told me that her class was doing Shakespeare. And she liked it. And I was what? You know, I was a little surprised. And then I said, well, what is it that you like about it? And I'll never forget this. She said, well, it's fun to say, and it's funny. And the play they were doing was the Comedy of Errors. But that's an eight or nine-year-old saying it's fun to say, because children like rhymes. They like to say them, right? And and so it's interesting. She was no Shakespeare scholar, but she already liked Shakespeare. That is That was similar to my first exposure to Shakespeare. I was about that age, and that's exactly why I liked it too, because he was the first writer I came across that had rhyming lines and yeah. and it was funny that was what I took away from it too so I that little girl this girl after my own heart oh my goodness <laughs> I know and she was at that's so little eight or nine I was like what what are you doing at school but you know that's that's wonderful you know, that's yeah. the power of Shakespeare you know well I know we would love to learn more about this topic what are some of your favorite books or resources that you can recommend for us to learn more well for me 
the best, absolutely at the top for anybody who's interested in this, is a book called Shakespeare's Metrical Art. And it's by George T. Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. And it's a book that I've gone through when I'm preparing, you know, a workshop or, uh, you know, talking to people about it, uh, about verse, or I will go back to and read a chapter. It's so thorough. And I honestly, I don't think anything else is in its category from, from my point of view. So that would be the one I would recommend. Now, we ask everyone this next question here at That Shakespeare Life, and that's, what's the one book you would take with you on a deserted island? My friends in England tell me I'm supposed to allow you the complete works of Shakespeare and a copy of the Bible, so your choice would be in addition to those. Well, I love this question, (laughs) and all of a sudden I'm imagining myself on an island with all of the time, you know, to read the Bible, which I love, and to read the complete works of Shakespeare some more, which I love. So that's fantastic. Strange. I was thinking about, is there some novel that I would reread and reread? But you know what I came up with? I hope this is fair. I would take the dictionary, the absolutely unabridged dictionary with me, because I could never get bored. Right? You just start with the A's <laughs> and work your way through it. And I just don't think you would ever get bored with the dictionary. <laughs> what an inventive choice. I like that selection very well. So what's next for you? What are you working on now that you're excited about? Well, two things. I'm, uh, I am a voice and speech teacher, and I'm starting a new... I teach at New York University, but in addition, I have my own private classes, and I'm starting a, next cl- uh, a new class in a couple of weeks, and that's a class that's voice work, speech work, text work, and the advanced part of the class is applying all of those techniques to Shakespeare, monologues from Shakespeare. And in addition, professionally, I'm the dialect coach for uh, a production of The Young Man from Atlanta by Horton Foote, which is playing at the signature stage here in New York City. So I start that in about two, two weeks. That doesn't have anything to do with Shakespeare. That's Texas. I'll be working with the actors on a Texas dialect, which I actually love doing, right? <laughs> that's, my, that's, that's in a couple of weeks. Oh, well done. Well done. Well, that sounds very exciting. And Shane and Yance, we appreciate you stopping by the studio today to visit with us and help us explore iambic pentameter. This has been delightful. Thank you for being here. Oh, it was so much fun for me. Thank you, Cassidy. <laughs>